I gotta give you your dream shot. I'm gonna send you up against the best. You two characters are going to Top Gun. This is DIA Connections. Man, we worked around the clock to, uh, to revise and change the tactics, the flight envelope of the airplane, the missile firing parameters. I mean, just about everything you can think about in the flying game. We would tell the F-4 guys, speed is life. If you kept your speed up and you fought the MiG in the vertical instead of a horizontal fashion, then you could beat him. I do remember talking to Tom Cruise several times, and one time he asked me, Bio, what's the most fun part of your job? Bio, what's the scariest part of your job? And so I told him, you know, about uh, the, the unlimited maneuverability and the power of flying. Flying high on this episode of DIA Connections. It's about Top Gun. In 2015, nearly 30 years after its release in 1986, the Library of Congress selected the movie Top Gun for entry into the National Film Registry. They stated, motion pictures chosen are the ones that deserve to be preserved because of their cultural, historic, or aesthetic importance. 30 years? Come on guys, really? What took you so long? Well, we shouldn't complain too much because it took even longer to make a sequel. Your reputation precedes you. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting an invitation back. They're called orders, Maverick. In 2022, Top Gun 2 Maverick hits the big screen. And here at DIA, we couldn't be happier because it gives us a chance to do a little bit of boasting about the contributions that we made to the Top Gun program in its infancy. Top Gun was a huge box office hit. It was number one in 1986. It chronicles the elite fighter pilots at the Navy's Fighter Weapons School, where they learn aerial combat tactics. The film became a cultural icon with lots of pop culture movie quotable quotes. Son, your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. And how about the soundtrack, Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins. And that wasn't even the Academy Award winner for Best Original Song. That Oscar went to Take My Breath Away by Berlin. And the cast wasn't too shabby either. Val Kilmer, Anthony Edwards, Meg Ryan, Tom Skerritt, Tim Robbins, Kelly McGillis, and of course, 24-year-old Tom Cruise. I had the shot. There was no danger, so I took it. But the real stars were the jet fighters and the realistic dogfighting scenes piloted by guys with call signs like Viper, Goose, Iceman, and Maverick. Amazing aerial sequences, a talented cast, cool music, and a great story. But what does all that have to do with the Defense Intelligence Agency? And what's the connection between the nation's premier all-source military intelligence organization and Top Gun? Those are high-caliber questions, and we've gathered a great ensemble cast for the answers. In a little bit, we'll hear from Dan Peterson, the linchpin of the Navy's original fighter weapons school. And... We spoke with an instructor from the school who just happened to be there when Tom Cruise flew in. But first on the flight deck is former DIA chief historian Greg Elder. So when we began in the Vietnam War, we started seeing fairly high aircraft losses of our own, which was very surprising because in the Korean War just 10 years earlier, we had been achieving a roughly 8 to 1 kill rate against MiGs. And suddenly, in Vietnam, in the beginning of the Vietnam conflict, we were seeing only two to one success rates against the MiG. The small MiG aircraft engaged both Navy and Air Force fighters, and in classic close-in dogfights, outmaneuvered the U.S. pilots. And that really raised a lot of, of concerns, because uh, obviously we can't afford to lose pilots, and we can't afford to lose aircraft at that type of rate when we are developing what are supposed to be the most sophisticated and capable aircraft in the world. So we really believed that we had to get our hands on these aircraft to better understand and be able to counter them. Taking on the crucial role of technical exploitation of adversary weapon systems for the Department of Defense 
was something the DIA had been doing since 1961. And that includes efforts to find MiGs, and we'll deep dive into that in a moment. But first, we asked Greg about the importance of other DIA exploitation programs. In 1987, we became highly involved in acquiring the Soviet Hindi helicopter. This was one of the Soviet's most sophisticated ground attack helicopters, uh, and we had seen its success in the Afghan war. Well, one of them had been shot down in Chad in what was called the Toyota War between Chad and Libya. And DIA, in working with our attaches um, on the ground and with the Chadian military, managed to go in in country and acquire the Hindi helicopter and bring it back to the United States for exploitation. Another example is at the beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom in 2001 in Afghanistan, We were seeing high losses of soldiers due to RPGs and light armor-piercing rockets that Taliban and al-Qaeda was using. So we went and we tested a number of different variants of these weapon systems to try to develop countermeasures of different armor to protect our soldiers, which ultimately resulted in the saving of thousands of lives. In 1968, working with one of our partners, DIA managed to acquire a MiG-21 and bring it to the Nevada desert, more specifically to a location known as Area 51. And I know what you're thinking, but sorry, none of that in this show. This flying object was clearly identifiable. However, we can tell you now about some of the odd names that were given to the programs from Area 51 in the 1960s. The first word was have, and in this instance, The second word was, believe it or not, donut. That's right, not half a donut, but have donut. Here's Greg Elder again. So there's a couple of explanations, one of which was the program manager uh, liked donuts. So one morning he was sitting down having coffee, and he saw the donut, and he said, wow, what do you know? I'll call it the the donut because the front of the MiG-21 looks like a donut. Uh, Another uh, explanation is that one of the scientists working on the MiG thought that the avionics, some some part of the avionics package looked like a donut. So in either case, it comes out to be have donut, and so we get have donut for one of the most successful exploitation programs in American history. We wanted to know more about how the findings of the DIA-led have programs benefited the Navy's new Advanced Fighter Weapons School. So we did a quick stopover at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio for a discussion with Robert Young. Rob served 28 years in the Air Force and Air Force Reserve and is an expert on aircraft and weapons systems. He's also spent 25 years working as a scientific and technical intelligence historian. Rob spoke with DIA's chief historian, Paul Isaacson, about his extensive research on enemy aircraft. But first, a warning. When two aviation enthusiasts start talking shop, you never know what's going to happen. Let's begin with Paul. As a boy, I just grew up studying military aircraft. I just knew, I, I just I just loved it. I was so into it. I So a lot of this is a very personal <laughs> topic for me, even just as a kid who looked into this and, and knew about MiGs and knew about F-4s and, oh gosh, this is, this, is, this is great. We're a funny breed because if you could have seen my models on my shelf as a kid, there were 109s and Focke-Wolfs and Zeros and I was always that kid that loved the bad guy stuff. See, that's kind of what I was talking about. Unbridled admiration for all things aviation. You gotta love it. Rob, why was it a necessity to get our hands on these Soviet aircraft? What did they actually do with these aircraft? And what were our goals? When you have something, you can fly against it in a controlled environment. Yeah, we're seeing these things in combat, but you're able to set the scenario in a training situation when you own one or when you've got one in your possession. So we were able to play the games that we wanted to play, set up the scenarios against specific aircraft, and then learn what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses in that particular situation. Another great line from Top Gun with particular relevance here. Remember when Tom Cruise, Maverick, 
high fives Anthony Edwards, who's Goose, and he says, I feel the need, the need for speed. We would tell the F4 guys, speed is life. Speed is life because below 15,000 feet, this aircraft would only go about 595 knots. It would go super fast, way up high. It would go like Mach 2, way up high. But down below 15,000, um, if you kept your speed up and you fought the MiG in the vertical instead of a horizontal, then you could beat him. What else did we learn about the aircraft that was very significant? We learned that the pilot does not have particularly good visibility. Uh, MiG-21 has got this big armor. It's like an armored windshield. It's like a windshield within a windshield. The pilot's visibility is not that great. And there is a cone of blindness, you know, uh, off the back end of the aircraft where you really can't see very good. We learned that engine response was not particularly good. If, if you're in a fight with a guy and he pulls his throttle back, you know, to slow down, well, if you blow by him, he tries to accelerate again. It would take, oh, I think it said like 14 seconds or something like that, you know, for it to really spool back up again. They learned you can turn this baby around in 20 minutes. Reliability, maintainability, that made it really a, a danger to us because it was so simple. Though those guys would, it would land, it would turn around, and it'd be back in the air again, coming at us without a whole lot of effort. They were hard to see. Those engines, those Russian engines, burned really clean. So Rob, with all this information two or three different programs, lots of sorties, lots of learning. What happened next? Well, the Navy led the way in applying this knowledge. In 1968, the Navy's new Fighters Weapons School was established to quickly train a nucleus of aerial warfare fighter crews for the fleet. The location was Naval Air Station Miramar, 15 miles north of San Diego and five miles from the coast. The mantra of the man put in charge was, second best is dead last. His name was Dan Peterson. They gave us 60 days to put together a graduate school. Man, we worked around the clock to, uh, to revise and change the tactics, the flight envelope of the airplane, the missile firing parameters, I mean, just about everything you can think about in the flying game. Peterson entered the Navy in 1953. He served in combat during the Vietnam War and accumulated more than 6,100 flight hours and 1,000 carrier landings. As a young lieutenant commander in 1968, he volunteered to be the school's first officer in charge. The mission reversed the unprecedented rate fighter jets were being shot down in Vietnam. Dan is 86 years young and writing another book about his accomplished career. Fortunately, he was kind enough to relive the Top Gun part with us. Dan, thanks for being here. In your book, Top Gun, an American Story, you write, this was the chance of a lifetime to affect much needed change. What was the first thing you did in this new role? I handpicked eight guys, including myself. Their ability to fly was never questioned. They were all second tour combat pilots. These guys had to be able to teach something new, which will initially be controversial. And they got to be able to stand up in front of their, their peers, if you will, and convince them that these new radical changes in tactics are truly uh, that much of an improvement. Dan writes, armed with our youthful ideas, we went about rewriting the rules of tactical air warfare in the F-4 Phantom. So Dan, we're familiar with dogfighting from the movie, but will you explain to us in layman's terms the new approach? 
The Phantom had power beyond anything we'd ever flown. But when you go fast and you're in the horizontal, you travel a long way. One of the things the Russians have done well with their airplanes in those days where the airplanes could turn tight and stay in close. So the Phantom driver lose sight of the little MiG. So really what we did is we converted from flying the dogfight in the horizontal. We started flying the Phantom in the vertical. We go straight up with it. The tactics were two of us versus whatever down below. Loose deuce tactics allowed us to put a lot of pressure on the MiGs. And we just fly in the vertical, one of them attacking, the other going up and back down. The Defense Intelligence Agency wrote tech and training manuals from what was learned about the MiGs. How valuable were those to you when you returned to base from the briefing sessions in Washington, D.C.? I came back with all the battle reports, things that were overclassified at the time. The fleet guys never got to look at them, but we got the information we needed to redesign our tactics, which we did. So that's where your organization really paid dividends. Through them and us, we were allowed to fly against some of the airplanes that your organization was exploiting. I actually have flown two of the kind of Russian airplanes. When you think you know some new tactics and you get to go up and imitate the enemy's tactics against your people and you see that you, you're right on the mark, it works. Using old trailers for classrooms, bartered for with a case of scotch, Dan revolutionized the art of aerial combat, a mission that clearly achieved its objective. From the first day of Top Gun students to the last day of the war, the kill ratio had gone from two to one in the beginning to 24 to one. We got 24 of them for every one of us. That ability to validate the tactics before we tried them on the enemy in, in, a, in a real shooting war, that saved so many lives. In the school itself, although it's been improved and it's gone on and on, it's still bigger and better and going strong in Fallon, Nevada. Name me something the government's done that's lasted over 50 years and continued to grow and get better and better and better. Well, DIA has been around for 60 years and has gotten much better. But we're not going to dispute a man who has served the country so admirably and is referred to as the godfather of Top Gun. Up next, a conversation with a former student and instructor at the Top Gun School. Okay, gents, basically the bogeys were in a very, very tight fighting wing at about 12,000 feet. What was your information? And he was a technical advisor on Top Gun, the movie. Everyone ready. And together, that makes the DIA connection. I would go back to Washington, the, the D.C. area, and talk to DIA and we would get the, the latest intelligence, observations, analysis of what various threat countries were doing. That's Dave Baranek. He enjoyed a 20-year career in the Navy, which included commanding an F-14 Tomcat fighter squadron. He had extensive Top Gun experience, and we're not just talking about the school. Navy Public Affairs told the Top Gun squadron that I was in at the time, they told us and they told the other people on base, look, this movie is getting made. So, you know, if you want it to be a good movie, work with these guys. Dave's call sign was Bio, and he was an air-to-air -air combat instructor at Top Gun in 1985, when Ready, Set, Action took on an entirely new meaning. You'll hear about his Hollywood exploits in a Q&A with Paul Isaacson. But first, let's hear about the humble beginnings of a career that almost never took off. 
As a boy, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and my parents took us to air shows. And so I think it, you know, it just soaked in to me. And when I was around 10, 12 years old, I decided I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So eventually I had to decide Navy or Air Force, and I decided to go with the Navy. And then when I was in college, my eyesight went bad. This caused me some distress because you cannot be a fighter pilot uh, unless you have 20-20 vision. So I could not be a fighter pilot, but then after thinking about my options, I realized I could be a RIO, a radar intercept officer in the new F-14 Tomcat. Wow, you certainly turned a negative into a positive. Dave, you mentioned being a RIO. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? A RIO is a radar intercept officer, and, uh, and since 1986, we can say like Goose in the movie Top Gun. Of course, that's right, that's right. The RIO is the backseater in a Navy fighter, and uh, his primary job is to operate the weapon system. And then his secondary job, though, for crew coordination was he was responsible for navigation and communications. Dave, how old were you when you became a RIO? And what was your first assignment? So at age 22, I was assigned to my uh, first fleet F-14 squadron. I was combat qualified, even though it was 1981 and there was no shooting war going on. And I was flying uh, day and night missions off an aircraft carrier or uh, at our home base at NAS Miramar in San Diego. We have a, uh, looks like a bandit. But we could be out there flying uh, four F-14s against an unknown number of adversary airplanes and you're running this complex radar intercept and doing a big dogfight you know flying 600 miles an hour and i mean it was it was great and the good thing is it was more than i ever imagined missile 11 o'clock hot dave has written three books not only about his top gun days but about his experiences on critical missions in volatile environments. Here he is again, speaking with Paul Isaacson, DIA's chief historian. My gosh, wow, just 22 years old. And this is in the early 1980s, right? During the Cold War. Can you share with us any experiences as it relates to that? The Cold War was uh, always present in our thoughts and our training and stuff like that. And in fact, we had uh, an officer give a briefing about concepts for global war. And uh, and part of our training was also to defend the uh, carriers and the other ships from an attack by Soviet bombers with cruise missiles. But when our carrier was out in the ocean, like in the Western Pacific or the Indian Ocean, uh, we would see Soviet patrol planes and bombers come up to the carrier. We would intercept them and escort them when they were in the vicinity. And then as as we were doing the escort, we would move into a closer position and we could actually see the, uh, the pilots and the air crews, the rear gunners, the pilots. I mean, you could see their faces and they would wave to you. Uh, they would hold up magazines, hold up uh, Pepsi and food and things like that. Sometimes they would try to get you to switch to their radio frequency and talk to them. But also there had been incidents where they tried to cause the American fighter to crash. You know, every time we went on these flights, we all reminded each other, look, you know, don't get too close to them. Don't lose your margin of safety and all kinds of things like that. Well, Dave, you don't need to admit this, but you must have been exceptional to be selected for Top Gun. What was that like? Oh, it was amazing. As with so many other things with fighter aviation, it was uh, more than I expected. Gents, uh, welcome to the best five weeks of your flying career. A lot of the class is lectures. And even though the uh, instructors were fighter pilots and fighter rios, They gave the most incredible lectures. I mean, they would give a two-hour detailed lecture with no notes, without saying the word, uh. (laughs) Just very controlled and precise. And then they would, you know, in the afternoon, they'd climb in their jet and they'd go out and kick your butt in a dogfight. 
In 1980, the U.S. Navy designated 451 naval flight officers. Four years later, only one of them became a Top Gun instructor, and that was Bio. And as we heard Dan Peterson mention earlier, DIA proved to be a valuable asset to Dave, too. Dave, earlier you mentioned that you would come here to the Defense Intelligence Agency for intel. What were you able to do with that information? And, like, were you able to share that in your classroom? We would look at, uh, you know, the highest classified material we were cleared, and we would talk to people that were already analysts and interpreters, and they would tell us things that helped us to shape our lectures. Due to the classification level, we couldn't reveal a lot of this detailed information in our classes, but we could use it to shape what we did teach, and in some cases, it, it could shape uh, tactics. The intel that Bio received, courtesy of DIA, proved vital not only for his students, but also for a different crew that came to Fighter Town, USA in 1985. Let's shift gears, or throttle back, if you will, and talk about Top Gun the movie. <laughs> oh, oh, you heard about that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I sure did. And I have to tell you, I was such a fan. I love that movie. Still do. And I remember the Navy actually set up booths outside theaters to do recruiting, to sign people up to join the Navy. But I can't wait to hear about your experiences. Tell us about the time they came to make the movie. And, and if you ever thought it would be such a hit. A couple of limos came on base with uh, people from Paramount Pictures or Hollywood, other wherever, and uh, they visited the admiral's office. And the Top Gun CO and XO went over, and they heard about the movie. And then the next day, we all heard about the movie. And I got to tell you, uh, I am not a good predictor because when I heard about this, I go like, you know, whatever. Tom Cruise. He was not a big star in 1985. He was someone we had just just barely heard of. Did you think that they were just going to come and go and not really capture the essence of what it meant to be a fighter pilot? Or did they impress you? They were interested in making a high-quality, entertaining movie. They went around uh, and solicited inputs. You know, what happened to you that was interesting? Or what is a saying that, that you've used or you've heard that is entertaining? They got orientation flights. They attended unclassified briefings. For, you know, weeks and weeks, they tried to expose themselves and get a sense of Top Gun and of Fighter Town. We have to ask you about Tom Cruise. Nowadays, I know he has a pilot's license for both airplanes and helicopters. But I really want to ask you what it was like back then during the shooting of the movie. Did he ask you lots of questions? Did you even personally meet with him? I did. Uh, he was uh, young. He was enthusiastic. And so I do remember talking to Tom Cruise uh, several times. And one time he asked me, you know, Bio, what's the most fun part of your job? Bio, what's the scariest part of your job? And so I told him, you know, about uh, the, the unlimited maneuverability and the power of flying. I told him probably some of the scariest parts were uh, night catapult shots and night refueling and things like that. You know, I, w I was honest with him. Uh, obviously, we all like being flying fighters. And so that came through. And and it wasn't only Tom and it wasn't only me. They, they fanned out across Miramar and they talked to everybody uh, or a lot of people. Dave, it's not like everybody can just go up there and fly around, right? That would be very risky business for Tom Cruise and everyone. I would love to hear about the prep work that went into that. To prepare for filming the scenes, uh, they went through a multi-stage process. And one thing was uh, director Tony Scott sketched out what he wanted uh, to fit the script and the flow of the story. So he drew storyboards. And then we briefed it in detail. And then we went up and flew it. There was a movie review show that ran in the 80s called At the Movies. Some of you might remember it. Roger Ebert was one of the hosts, and he was known to be a pretty harsh critic. But here's what he said about Top Gun. Quote, The remarkable achievement in Top Gun is that it presents seven or eight aerial encounters that are so well choreographed that we can actually follow them most of the time. And the movie gives us a good secondhand sense of what it might be like to be in a dogfight. I got to tell you, those scenes looked pretty good. I mean, I can remember just 
how real it was to spinning upside down and chasing planes and feeling dizzy just watching it on the screen. Uh, I mean, were you up there? What was that like? And did you have to do a lot of reshooting or what did you have to do to make it look so real? They did. We did have to reshoot some scenes. And uh, one example that I was involved in was uh, there are a couple of scenes in the movie where they do head on passes. So we went out there to film that. We we planned it. Uh, we briefed it. We went out and filmed it. And the uh, director goes, he goes, gents, that's not going to be close enough. I mean, he could just look at what it looked like. And he said, that's not close enough. So we had to, we flew apart. Uh, we talked about it a little bit on the radio. Then we flew together again and we passed closer to each other. And he goes, that's better. That's better. Uh, do it one more time and, and get closer. Well, we we're coming at each other and we, we weren't going super fast because you don't need to be, but our closing speed was about 600 knots and you're passing within a couple of hundred feet of the other jet and you've got multiple airplanes in both formations. So it required a lot of skill and a little bit of nerve. Uh, but in the end, you know, we got the job done and it looked good on camera. Boy, did it ever look great. Incredible. Now, I know that your work on the movie wasn't just limited to flying. They needed your expertise on something else, right? Can you tell us that story? You know, I did not even see that coming. But when the, the filming was done, the, uh, the Paramount people were looking at their flying sequences and they said, we've got a lot more flying scenes that w than we expected. And we don't know how to put them together. And we don't know what people should be saying. So they asked Top Gun to send up a a couple of guys, a pilot and a Rio, to uh, help them with all that. And I was the Rio. So the first thing we did was we looked at the, all the film clips that Paramount had, and we helped them to cut them together in a, a logical sense. Because, I mean, that was our business, was thinking in three dimensions, you know, debriefing and things like that. And Paramount, frankly, they didn't, that wasn't their strong suit. You know, that's why they had us. So you're actually helping Paramount Pictures edit these scenes together. That's amazing. We were sitting at the editing machine. The guy showed us how to operate the editing machine and how to make the marks on the film and stuff. And so it's like we're editing the movie. And so then uh, after we got a rough thing, he goes, okay, it'll just take me a few minutes to put it together. So then he, he puts, and I really, to this day, I don't know what they were working with. You know, was this a copy of the film or whatever? But in the end, they put together all these scenes. They had 20 minutes or so of flying. And then he goes, okay, now we're going to show you guys this and we want you to talk. We want you to say anything, whether it's pilot, Rio, talking on the radio or whatever. And we just... We're Gabby talking through the whole thing and all the stuff that they say or not everything when they say, you know, tally two, or right, right. One o'clock or whatever. We gave them all those words and then somebody Hollywooded it up. They added the I'll hook them and I'll fry them. We did not say that, but, but that's a, that's something that goose and the crew crew says early in the movie. Oh, that's a great story. And Hollywooded it up. I love it. I love it. Dave, with your stellar career, with all of its experiences, what was it like to sit in a theater and see your name up on the big screen? Seeing my name in the credits was a real surprise because Paramount had asked all of us to write our names down if we flew in the movie. And so it was all 16 Top Gun instructors. And then I heard that the credits were too long and we weren't going to be in them. And I said, okay, whatever. I mean, I, I can't affect that. So then when we finally saw the movie and our names were in the credits, I thought, all right, that is cool. <laughs> I mean, I'll admit that. We hope the new movie is as good as the original. And speaking of original, we thought it only fitting to give Dan Peterson, the founder of Top Gun, the final thought. If I were going to thank DIA for, for that effort, you validated all the work we did. I can't tell you how many guys' lives were probably saved because the majority of our students left us, left the graduate school and went back out to the fleet. And we knew what we were doing because we had participated with the IA and uh, very worthwhile programs. 
To learn more about the Defense Intelligence Agency's commitment to excellence in defense of the nation, check us out on social media or go to DIA.mil. And please, don't forget to rate, review, and follow DIA Connections. Thanks for listening.